coast of Southwest Africa is an unforgiving land of stark rocks and wandering dunes. Its shores are pounded by great breakers and swept by cold currents. Its weather alternates between wind and fog and blasting sun. It has but one saving grace. There are diamonds. These graceful canyons were sculptured beneath the sea many thousands of years ago by moving water armed with abrasive sands and gravels. The gravels contained diamonds, and when the ocean level receded, the gravels were left behind. Now that they have been removed by mining, the strange shapes of these ancient undersea canyons are revealed. In other parts of the mine, the old sea floor was nearly flat, and after the main part of the diamond gravels have been removed by machines, Native sweepers carefully clean the cracks in the bedrock. Occasionally they find greasy bits of hardened fire, diamond crystals. Are there similar deposits on the present ocean bottom? Britt Brock and Willard Bascom plan an expedition to find out. The Cossack Coast is a small freighter converted for geophysical work. It leaves Cape Town's beautiful harbor and heads north to the Diamond Coast, where it will probe the seafloor with sound to determine the thickness of the undersea gravels and the shapes of the rocks beneath. Once outside the harbor, the ship feels the great South Atlantic swell and begins to buck. It will be a rough trip, but happy porpoises alongside of the traditional sailor's omen of a lucky voyage. The sun sets, but the captain remains at his post, knowing that many a vessel has been wrecked on this dark coast, and that only the vigilant will survive. The following morning, the geophysical equipment is launched. First, a spark gap is streamed behind the ship. When a high voltage electric current surges through this cable, a spark leaps the gap, creating a small explosion. And then a hydrophone, which listens for the echoes of those explosions from the undersea rocks, is put overside. The hydrophones trail well behind, away from the noise of the ship, on a cable that is buoyed up by a plastic hose. In the ship's laboratory, the spark generating equipment is started. Each time the spark jumps here, a similar one jumps at the end of one of the cables and radiates a pulse of sound. The hydrophone at the end of the other cable detects the echoes from the various undersea layers. Thus, the rock structure is recorded. The flowing paper is periodically examined and the instrument settings adjusted to give the best results. That pair of cables will follow the ship for 10,000 kilometers as it goes back and forth, in and out, along the desert coast where dunes rise hundreds of feet from the sea and shifting underwater sandbars are an extra hazard that keeps the captain constantly on the bridge. Often the work continues after dark when a technician makes the final marks on a chart takes it below for study. In the one-time cargo hold, two geologists examine the record for evidence of gravel deposits and for undersea features like the ancient sea cliffs and canyons seen ashore. The dark lines are the recorded echoes of rocks buried beneath sea and sediment. But determining exactly what the echoes mean is not a simple matter. It requires thoughtful geological interpretation. 
Are the diamonds? It's much too soon to say. Our search has just begun. Determining the thickness of the undersea gravel beds is only half the geophysicist's problem. He must also know the ship's position precisely so that a chart can be made of any deposits that are discovered. Precise position at sea requires survey points on land, and so a shore party starts out across the trackless desert in Land Rovers. Their job is to find the old survey monuments and check their positions. They resurvey each point and then they push on across the wasteland. At each monument, a radar beacon is set up, an electronic package that shines like a lighthouse on the ship's radar. The shore party leader radios to the ship. Our beacon is operating. Do you see it? The ship's radar antenna scans the horizon. Bright and clear, answers the radio operator on the ship. OK, on to the next one. There are various hazards, but these are a normal part of desert operations. And so the shore party moves steadily up the coast, leaving behind a trail of electronic monuments. Each beacon makes a bright spot on the ship's radar screen. With this equipment, the ship's position can be determined within a few feet. In an adjacent room on the ship, the automatic position plotter is set up on a chart of the coast. The position of the needle is controlled by the radar so that it traces the ship's motion on the chart. The operator adjusts the range rings on the radar scope until they exactly coincide with the bright spots made by the beacons on shore. Then the distance of the beacons can be read directly. Every three minutes, the operator pushes a button and the ship's position is pricked into the chart. Beyond the old monuments, new survey lines must be run across the desolate Namib Desert. The skeleton coast is a hard country, inhabited only by the ghosts of diamond miners who worked here before World War I. In those days, this camp was supplied by camel and oxen, the only way of crossing the desert. But now we use a helicopter, the Skylark. But the helicopter cannot operate alone. Its fuel must be brought in by another aircraft. And so the party radios for a small, rugged cargo plane called the Beaver to bring in gasoline and supplies. For emphasis, they spell out the message in beer bottles and survey flags. Send the Beaver. And the Beaver comes. It takes off from a desert airstrip circles above a mirage, zooms out across the coast of Southwest Africa. North it flies along the Great Wall of Sand, where camel supply trains were ever in danger of being trapped against the steep sand slope by a rising tide. flies over the breakers and sandbars and lagoons, over a flight of white pelicans, and over a herd of gemsbok, the great desert antelope. Beaver buzzes the camp to alert the party before alighting on a vast natural airport where no plane has ever before landed. And now, with plenty of fuel, the Skylark can go where it pleases, over the Namib Sea of Sand.
The surveyors are but tiny dots on the vast dunes, entirely dependent on the helicopter for life, for it is doubtful that a man could walk out of this desert alive if it failed to appear. A theodolite is set up to measure the angle between the last survey point and the one ahead. Neither would be visible except for a flash of sun reflected in a mirror. The angle between the distant points is measured and recorded. The tellurometer is an electronic tape measure. It measures distance by measuring the time for radio waves to travel between a pair of instruments. When the measurements are completed, the helicopter goes back to pick up the second survey party. Then it leapfrogs the men and their equipment from 10 miles behind to 10 miles ahead. Even in a sandstorm, the work goes on, for the navigation beacons must keep well ahead of the ship. One day, the ship radios that one of the radar beacons many miles behind us has stopped operating. It must be adjusted before the oceanic survey can continue. So back over the waves of sand, the Skylark goes in search of the tiny speck that guides the ship. The technician removes the cover, makes an adjustment, and calls the ship. Now do you see it? Fine. At sea, waiting for the beacons, it's a lazy day, and an old friend comes to visit. The water looks so inviting, the geologists decide to go below and look at the bottom and compare the rocky features with those exposed on land. An underwater television camera and light is lowered so that those on the ship can see what the divers see. The divers descend into a world of blueness where the only sound is their own breathing. They are not quite alone. An octopus dives with them to the seafloor, where it glowers ferociously and tries to look as large as possible. But the divers are concerned only with geology. They are looking for rocks similar to those on shore. They find only sand. And a bat ray, disturbed by these unlikely intruders, turns and flies off into the gloom. The octopus, deciding against valor, also flees the sand, jetting himself to the protective darkness of some weed-hung rock. Unwittingly, he has led the geologists to the rocks they seek. They examine a rocky ledge, 
chip off fragments so they can see what a fresh rock surface looks like. And then on again. But soon it is time to return to the ship. Up we go. Okay? And thus one more link is added to the chain of knowledge. Sometimes the sea is calm, and sometimes it's not so calm. The weather gets steadily worse, but the work goes on until a rising storm forces us to stop operations for the day. Even the worst weather must end, and eventually the ship returns to the calm of Table Bay and Cape Town Harbor. The splash of the anchor stirs the seabirds. The data are taken ashore to be converted into useful maps. Now we have a detailed chart of the undersea rocks. The yellow patches are soft sediments, sands and gravels, the blank areas are barren rock. The dashed lines mark the rim of the hard sediments. The next move is to take samples of the gravels, for one must actually recover diamonds from the seafloor to prove that they are there. Since the samples must be systematic, we plan to drill lines of holes at regular intervals. Dr. David Smith indicates one line where 30 such samples will be taken and processed. A new sampling system is required. With millions of rond at stake, our engineers work against the time deadline to construct a ship that can accurately sample the undersea deposits. A dredge pump is swung aboard. Special propellers are made ready. A derrick for handling drill pipe and dredging equipment is assembled. A console on the bridge makes this ship easy to maneuver. For this is Rock Eater of Cape Town. In record time, its conversion is completed and it sails for the Diamond Coast. Rock Eater is the world's first ship designed specifically for mineral exploration. On the run up the coast, it is steered automatically by the gyro pilot. The captain merely sets the controls and watches the radar. Rock Eater drops anchor above a gravel bed that was detected by the seismic survey. The captain, watching from the bridge, gives orders for adjusting the anchor lines. And the chief mate on the bow 
hears the orders on the intercom and directs the winch operators. Chief geologist aboard checks the ship's position visually by sighting on monuments ashore with a pelorus. He sings out the angle and it's plotted on the chart. Here we will drill for diamonds. Driller lifts the brake and starts the pumps. The drill starts down. As it goes down, Water is sucked up the center of the drill pipe. It flows along the pipe to the left. When the white stream of water turns brown, we will know the bit is drilling into the bottom. There. The drilling is tough, but the bit grinds its way downward. Now gravel is flowing along this pipe and onto the screens, which sort it according to size. The small gravel, which contains the diamonds, goes through the screen into bins below. Geologists watch the bouncing pieces of rock for schist, the solid rock which will indicate that the drill has completely penetrated the gravels. There, that's it. Retract the drill. Rock Eater drills 30 such holes each day. Now the overside discharge is white again. And already Rock Eater is moving to a new spot to start the next hole. Below deck, the plant operators get ready to process the sorted gravel for diamonds. This jigging motion causes the denser stones, including the diamonds, to concentrate in the center, while a light material flows over the rim. Periodically, the trays are removed and upended on a sorting table so that the concentrates can be examined for diamonds. There's one. Diamonds. Diamonds from under the sea. 